That green book with words in it. And music. There's music in there too. <laughs> yes. 435. Tim, is this the one I'm supposed to use this morning? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 435. verse 1, where it says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit, and what needless pain we bear. Okay, that's, that's a, this songwriter did something wonderful for you. It's reminding you that you don't need to go through all this bad stuff. Just take it to the Lord in prayer, and we don't do that. I think we should sing that other one, too. I think there's more people coming. I think we want another song. Davia, I need help. 404. Davia, come up and help me sing. 404 in your hymn book. She has five. Four verses. Yeah, we'll just sing it. Then I don't have to teach as much. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest upon unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking 
sin. His oath, His covenant, His blood, so poured me in the whelming flood. When ill around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, all less to stand before the throne. Christ the Son. Good singing, and I, I and once again, the author of this reminds us that there's only one ground to stand on, and that's Jesus Christ. Yet, I don't know why we spend all our time standing on sink and sand. We do it all the time, and we really need to look to the Lord first and uh, get it out of that rut. We always think our way is the best way. Well, guess what? Our way is not the best way. We are sinners, and we think like sinners, and God's way is the best way, so we need to really count on Him. And so stand on the solid rock. She loves that in, in a lot of the hymns, the fourth verse is always about glory, going to glory. You know, the hope that we have, you know, because we have hope in Jesus Christ and the resurrection. You know, he's the first fruit of the resurrection and that gives us hope because we're the harvest, you know, and, and so that does, does make life better. Especially who here that is getting a little older finds more joy in that fact that there's a resurrection. There's great joy, isn't there? There is. And so, so we love that. Why don't we go ahead and we'll bow our heads and uh, open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the privilege to be in your house. We just love you, Lord. And, uh, and I know that we, we don't show it enough. Uh, please help us to come to you with, with humble hearts and and appreciate the fact that we can come to you in prayer and that we can come to you in praise and worship, Lord. Uh, help us as we sing songs, as we study the lesson, to see all the things that you do for us and all the things that you teach us so that we can be in awe and then we can praise and glorify you all the more. In your name, amen. All right. So today, the lesson is Israel receives a land... And God was faithful to his promise to give Abraham's descendant a land. So what, what book have we been in? Joshua. Joshua, right? So this promise goes all the way back to the beginning of what book? Genesis, right? So this is a, a promise long coming. And uh, Pastor and I talked about that a little bit, is that as humans, especially in today's world, who here when you want something, want it now? We do, right? You know, the, the, it's a, but the Lord's timing is totally different than our timing. And, uh, and sometimes we just need to learn to have patience, lean on the Lord and be patient, and, and, and realize that he's going to do what's best for us. So Joshua 1, nine says, have not, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wherever thou goest. All right, so we're in Joshua 11, and verse 1 says this, it says, And it came to pass, when Jabin king of Hazar had heard those things, that he sent Joab king of Madon, and the king of Shamron, and to the king Ashaphel, and to the kings that were on the north of the mountains and on the plains south of Chinnereth and in the valley and in the borders of Dor on the west. Who here loves reading the names and places in the Old Testament out loud? Okay, yeah, I don't either. And the Canaanites 
on the east and on the west, in the Amorite, in the Hittite, in the Pezerite, in the Jebusite, in the mountains, and the Hivite, under Hermon, in the land of Mizpah. And they went out, they and all their hosts, with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude, with horses and chariots very many. And when all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. So here's our first five verses. And of course, the first question is, who came against Israel? They all did, right? It, it seems like they all did. Yeah, that's, that's kind of how I get the summary, is we could list individuals. But it sounds like anyone that was anyone that Israel hadn't conquered yet said, we can solve this. We just got to come together. So they all came together. Wow. Yep. And, uh, and how many of them were there? How many does it say there were? As many as the sand. The sand. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Even as the sand that is upon the seashore. Okay. And there were that many. And, they, and then they brought horses and chariots too. Okay. And, uh, and of course... They gathered together because they, in verse 1, it said they had heard what the Lord had done. So I, I looked at it as they had already seen what the Lord did for Israel in the south of the land. Now Israel's moving. And so those are the things that they had heard. And, of course, they figured they had a better chance if they come together against Israel. Is that a good plan? It is, right? That's a good plan. But the only thing that... You, human planning can't do is it's not going to thwart the will of God. And that was not God's plan. Okay. And so it didn't matter how many of them were. And I love that the sands of the sea, because it's telling us something important here is that this army was bigger than Israel and Israel should not have defeated them. It shouldn't have. This is, this is God's victory. And so, so we see this and Continuing in verse 6, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them. I love that. Has there been a theme here, like from verse 1 in Joshua? What's the Lord always doing for Joshua? He's encouraging him. Okay? Who here would like to be encouraged more? Okay? Okay. Read your Bible. <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to be encouraged more, just read your Bible every day. You're going to be encouraged more if you read, read the Word of God. So it says, the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about the same time I will deliver them up all slain before Israel. Think about that. All slain before Israel. Thou shalt hew their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua came and all the people of war with him against them. And suddenly they fell upon them. So what was God's response I'm going to take care of it, right? I see the problem. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I got it, okay? Uh, what was Joshua's response to God's encouragement? What did Joshua do? Yeah, he praised the Lord, but he also, he grabbed all the men and said, okay, this is what the Lord wants us to do. Let's gather together. So he got his army together. And uh, one thing I, I hadn't thought of but this is a question I, I, I should ask, is why do you think the Lord wanted their horses hamstrung and their chariots burned with fire? They couldn't be used again, but who couldn't use them again? No, the enemy is going to be defeated. So who would have ended up with the chariots? Israel, right? God doesn't want them to have all those horses and chariots. He wants them to trust in him, not in horses and chariots, right? And that's what we want to do. We want to trust, you know, we, we always plan ahead. We're always trying to do the best we can to secure our life and our, and our family and, and everything else. But the Lord still wants us to count on him. Yes. It is in the book of Psalms. It's one of them. Yeah, but men do. They do. They, and that's, the Lord doesn't want us to do that, okay? He blesses us, 
okay? He may bless you financially, okay? But he doesn't want you to count on that, those finances. He wants you to count on him. He's given you the finances as a blessing, but he still wants you to count on him. In this case, he gave the army a victory, and he's with the army. He doesn't want them to count on horses and chariots. He wants them to count on the Lord. And so we see that same thing. We can take that and apply it to ourselves as any way that the Lord has blessed us. He doesn't want us to take that blessing and have that be the thing that gives us confidence. He wants our confidence to be in him, not in things. Yes, Sharon. The finances, that's why he created tithing. Yes. If we trust him, we have to give him the top 10%. Yes. Yep. No, she said that's why, you know, he talks, the Lord talks about tithing. In the scripture, you, you see about tithing. Yes, Aaron. Psalm 20, verse 7. Yep. And then Isaiah does the same thing. And really, that's, you know, when, when we talk about chariots and horses and you read about it in the Old Testament, it's all about military power. That, that's one way of relating it is military power. The, uh, and Sharon, you brought up a good thing about counting finances. And the Bible talks about tithing. And, and of course, it's tough when preachers talk about tithing because some people get a little sensitive about, oh, He's talking about my money. Well, in reality, in the Old Testament, Israel had to tithe, okay? Not only did they tithe, but they gave their first fruits. And then they had this sacrifice and that sacrifice. By the time they were done, the average Israelite would have given 30 to 40% of their income to the nation. But think about it. They're not just giving to the temple. They were also giving to the army, they were also supporting the country. So they gave about 30 to 40%. As we get to the New Testament, tithing, everyone goes, well, there's no tithing in the New Testament. That's true. Because Jesus says, look, you're my stewards. Everything you have is mine. <laughs> okay? And so, so we don't see that give a tenth, give a tenth. You know, the Lord says that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. We, we go over all these wonderful things. But in reality, I think, Sharon, like you mentioned the tenth, I think the tenth is a great place for someone to start. And as you give your tenth, and as you start supporting missionaries outside your tenth, all of a sudden you realize that you still have the same amount of money. And you're like, wait a minute, I thought I was giving away money. And then the Lord blesses you and you have more money. And guess, guess what? Since all of it's his anyway, that tenth is kind of not enough anymore. You're like, well, gee, I have more money. I can give to more missionaries. I can give more to the church. And so, so we see this idea, and it's super important because what you find is you have churches where people tithe no matter how much money they make. The poor people tithe, the rich people tithe, and the Lord blesses that. It, it's, it's like the, the, the plate just overflows. The Lord takes that money and really multiplies it. Then on the other hand, you have a lot of churches where the people that, that feel they can't afford to give money to the church struggle because the Lord doesn't bless them, okay? We can go back into the book of Hosea for that. The Lord, Lord actually tells them, look, you don't have money in your pockets because I cut a hole in it. <laughs> All your money you're bringing in, I've made fall out your pants. You don't have any money because you're not doing the right thing. You're ignoring me. And so you can see the same thing in the modern church is in the modern church, the churches where people say, well, I can't afford to give. God doesn't bless those people financially because, because they can't even, they, they don't even acknowledge what the Lord's done for them, you know? And so, so they have holes in their pockets, yet the people that give, the Lord somehow brings more money and, and it allows them to give. So that's, that's an important thing. You don't hear it from the the pulpit enough. And someone talked to me about this the other day, and I'm like, well, it's tough when you talk about tithing because you don't want to just bring up tithing. I said, but when it comes up in scripture and in Sunday school, we should talk about it. Thank you, Sharon, for bringing that up because only if it goes with what I said.
Yeah. So, yep. So you, someone told her to gradually increase your tithing. Uh, I, I find the the best principle you could ever do. Well, here's a question for you: Would for those of you that are working, or even those that are retired, uh, do you get 100% of your paycheck, or does someone take some before you even see it in your hands? That someone already took some, right? The government took it. Okay. And so. When you get that paycheck, you should, the first thing you should do is sit down and, and say, okay, here's my tithe. You know, the government's already taken their share. God's just as important, right? And, and more important, you know, so, so do that. Pay that, get that done, so it's out of there. One thing I've learned about finances is if it's in your account, guess what you're going to do with it? You're going to spend it. And at the end of the week, you're not going to know where it went. <laughs> It's just gone. It's just gone. So, so you, as, as we think about that, we are to be good stewards of what God gives us. Everything we have, God has blessed us with. And so not only do we give back to the Lord in tithes and offerings, we also give him of our time. We also give him of our talents. There are many people in churches that the Holy Spirit's gifted them and they take their talent and bury it in the sand. And what was the Lord's response for that person, burying a talent in the sand? Yeah, yeah. Woe to you, he took it away. You know, you're supposed to use your talent. Those were given these gifts to serve the Lord, but also to serve the church. And so we want to do that. So, okay, so that was a good little, uh, little side trip. No, no, no. No, I, it's, it's a good bunny trail that we need to talk about, and people need to be encouraged about it, because a lot of people are afraid that, that they can't live without that first 10%. And what I found is that you, what's true is you can't live without giving that first 10%. If you don't, I guarantee you're definitely going to struggle. Uh, and so, so you definitely want to do that. Okay. Joshua 11, chap, uh, verse 10, And Joshua at that time turned back, took Hazar, and smote the king thereof with the sword, for Hazar before time was the head of all those kingdoms. I love that. Joshua lets the leader get into... I mean, the Lord lets Joshua take the leader of this army. Okay, Think about it. How many people are in that army? Sands of the sea. What are the chances out of the army of Israel, that Joshua gets to kill that guy. It's, it's low, right? But the Lord, the Lord does that. He delivers that leader into Joshua's hand. And they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not any left to breathe. He burnt Hazar with fire. Okay, they destroyed them all. And all the cities of those kings and all the kings of them did Joshua take and smote them with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. But as for the cities that stood still in their strength, Israel burned none of them, save Hazar only. That did Joshua burn. And all the spoils of these cities and the cattle, the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, neither left they any to breathe. And the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He had left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So here we have in verses 12 through 15, really it's a summary passage, going back to where Moses had instructed and Joshua is fulfilling that. Go in there and utterly destroy these. Don't feel bad, and people want to make you feel bad about the Old Testament. Well, well look at Israel. They went in there and killed everyone. They were the sword of the Lord. These people were being punished for paganism. Okay? How bad was their paganism? They sacrificed their own children to gods made with hands. Okay? So this is, this is righteous judgment that's going on here. It's not just one nation taking over another nation. This is righteous judgment of the Lord, and the sword of the Lord is the army of Israel. So Joshua took all the land, the hills, and all the south country, and the land of Goshen, and the valley, and the plain, and the mountain of the Israel, and the valley of the same, 
even from the Mount of Halak, and then goeth up to Seir, even to Belgad and the Valley of Lebanon, under Mount Hermon, and all the kings he took and smote them and slew them. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, and all the other they took in battle. So now, <clears throat> verses 16 through 19, we see kind of a summary of Joshua. It's just pulling it together. Believe me, all this didn't happen in that 20 seconds that I read. Okay, so this was a long time to conquer the land. Verse 20, And for it was the Lord, for it was of the Lord to harden the hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. So how was the Lord working here behind the scenes? What was he doing? What does it say he did? It's not very loving. Right? People say, well, that's not loving. He hardened their heart. They were already hard. And they'd already had time to repent and they didn't. Okay? And so now it was time for judgment. And so... So the Lord hardened their hearts so as Israel continued to conquer, all those nations that would come after would have their hearts hardened so that they would go to war with Israel. He didn't want them to all of a sudden repent. They, they were getting their punishment. And so he hardened their hearts. Remember I said these were pagans that sacrificed their children. Uh, was repentance available at this time in the land for those people? No. No. It had come and pass, and God had hardened their hearts so that his righteous judgment would take place. And we see the same thing in, in 2 Thessalonians. What's God say after the rapture? What's going to happen? There's going to be a strong what? Delusion. Okay? Where people just aren't going to believe. They're going to believe lies, and they're not going to believe what they've heard before about the Bible. So a lot of people are going to, they're just going to believe the lies and, and they won't come to repentance. Some will come to repentance, but. Yep. Yeah, they didn't believe. They, everyone has been giving light. Okay? And the Bible's clear. The Lord will judge you based on the light you have. So if you're an unbeliever in this church, you're in big trouble. Okay? Because the pastor preaches the Bible, it means you have more light than other people. And so you're going to be judged on the fact that you have that light and, and how you respond to it. So in the, in the book of Revelations, we see the same thing. Uh, uh, those that take the mark of the beast their hearts are hardened and they can't come to Christ after that. Uh, on, on the opposite side, when you, Jesus in Matthew 24, he literally comes out and says that his elect cannot bow to the beast. In other words, so it's kind of the opposite. He says the elect at that time can't bow to the beast, whereas those that have taken the mark of the beast can never repent. And so... We see that as it's kind of, you see the righteous judgment, and you also see God's righteous grace at the same time on opposite ends there. Verse 21, And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakins from the mountains from Hebron, from Deber and Amba, and from all the mountains of Judah and all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There were none of the Anakins left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, in Ashdod, there remained. So the Anakins were giant people in the land. And it says here, where did, where did some of the Anakins remain? Gaza and Gath, right? Who do we know from Gath? Someone tall. Goliath. Goliath, okay? So, so that's where we have Goliath. And uh, so the, 
The first time we hear about giants is, is back in Numbers 13. And in Numbers 13 was when Moses sent the spies into the land. And 10 of them came back and said, these guys, they're giants. <laughs> There's no way we can go in there and defeat them. Okay, so if you remember going back to Numbers, 10 of the spies said, no, there's giants in the land. There's no way we can succeed. Okay? And then there were two that said, no, 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 no. No, the Lord will give us all this. Who are those two? Joshua and Caleb. All right? So Joshua took the whole land according to all the land, said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. So this is the conclusion. The promises of Moses were fulfilled. The land was given as an inheritance to Israel, which was a promise to Abraham. Okay? And the land rested from war. Okay? And it's interesting, as I look at this, the land rested from war. I, I could almost, you could almost rephrase that and say the land rested from God's judgment. Because really this whole thing is a judgment of the Lord. So now it says then the we're going to we're going to jump ahead to 14 cuz remember we just talked about the two spies that did not fall prey to the worries about the giants so now we're going to read about Caleb a little bit and then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal and Caleb the son of I don't know the Kenite said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses to the man of God concerning me. And the end. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me into the land to spy out the land, and I brought him word as it was in my heart. So, so we have Caleb here. He's saying, look, I went to the land. I came back, and I told him, hey, maybe there's giants in there, but we can take it. You know, and, and, and that was, that's what he told them. Nevertheless, my brethren, they went up with me, made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. So this is interesting. So Caleb comes back and he gives a good report. And what's Moses promise him? Where you walked, that's going to be for you and your children. Okay? Now we're going to find out where he walked. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years. So how old is he now? No, well, the, no, the Lord kept him alive 45 years. He was 40 when he spied out the land. So now he's 85. Okay? So he's 85. Ever since the Lord spoke these words unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness... And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and eighty-five years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that the Lord sent me. As my strength was then, even so my strength is now for war, both to go out and to come in. I love it. Here he was among the best, right? Do you think Moses sent in the wimpy to spy out the land? No, he sent in tw twelve of the best. And Caleb's saying, look, I'm as strong now as I was then. You know, and I love that. I think that's a blessing of the Lord. I think the Lord did that for him. Caleb here is with all these younger guys, but it says here the Lord kept him and gave him his strength. And he said, I'm just as strong today as I was when I was 40. Who here that's 85 can say that? Any of you? No, but that's what he's saying here. And now, therefore, give me this mountain. I love that. I just, can, don't you just want to be a fly on the wall for this conversation? So he goes to Joshua and he tells him this history and he says, give me that mountain. Okay, he wants that mountain. That's his. It was promised to him the, that the Lord spoke in that day, for thou hearest in the day how the Anakins were there and their cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Je Jehonam, Hebron, for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, 
because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the land had rest from the war. So think about this. What are your thoughts here about Caleb? Any thoughts about Caleb? Well, it sounds like he really trusted the Lord. He really trusted the Lord. Yep. Any other thoughts? He was determined, and, and, and one thing we, we don't want to the miss with, you know, determination isn't everything you need in life, okay? Uh, his determination was backed by something very powerful, and his determination was backed on the promises of the Lord and what the Lord had done for him. So number one, he had followed the Lord. Number two, there was no doubt the Lord was with him. Number three, even though he was older, the Lord kept him strong like he, like he was a young man. And I love that. Oh, wouldn't I love that? All right. Were all the promises of Abraham fulfilled? Well, let's see which ones were fulfilled. Okay. So it says, how did the prophecy about the land in Genesis 15 find its fulfillment in Joshua? It says... The land from the river Egypt on the south to the Euphrates in the north and all the territory in between was inhabited by those tribes listed. How about the prophecy in Genesis 17? They find their fulfillment in Joshua 23. The Israelites grew into a great nation represented by 12 tribes and separated from the nations around them. Remember, they were supposed to be a separate people. Okay, They were supposed to be a peculiar people. They were different. They didn't eat the same things. They, worsh they didn't worship all these different gods. They worshiped one God. They were supposed to be different. Okay? You and I, as the church of the Lord, are called to be different. We're not supposed to be the same as the world that we walk in. When people walk in here as guests, they should they should, feel, they should feel loved, but it should be a little odd to them because we're not the same as the world they're in. We're different. And the reason they're coming is because they're not satisfied with the norm. They're looking for something different. So Israel was to be a lighthouse. They were to be a beacon. They were supposed to be totally different. They were supposed to be a witness of God. Now, they failed at that, but we can fail at that too. How did the sign of the covenant of Genesis 17 find fulfillment in Joshua 5? It says, Joshua had all the males circumcised to mark them as members of the covenant given to Abraham. How did the promise of the seed or offspring in Genesis 12, 1, 3, and 22, 18 find its fulfillment in Joshua? Other than the per preservation of the tribe of Judah through whom the Messiah would come, the promise of the seed hadn't been fulfilled at this point, but it pointed towards Jesus. So God promised Abraham that every nation would be blessed through him, okay? And, and Jesus is, is the answer of that. But as you read the genealogy, you have those genealogies that you usually like to skip. You know, when you read in Matthew and Luke, as you read those, what you find is you find people from what we've been studying in the genealogy. And so we see that. What are some of the parallels we can draw between Jesus and Joshua? What do you think? They were both faithful and did what the Lord said, yeah. Even Jesus, even though he was God, he didn't do his own will. He did the Father's will, you know, so no doubt about that. So uh, their names are actually the, the same. Joshua and Jesus are the same. And uh, so we see that uh, both were faithful leaders of their people. Both led the establishment of the nature, nation like Joshua led Israel, whereas Jesus, he was always talking about the kingdom of God. Was that Israel per se? No, this was, a, this was a new nation. That was all those that would follow believers. That's right. And so, so we see that. And both of them delivered, right? Joshua delivered their people into the promised land. Jesus delivers us into the promised land. So we can see all those correlations. So here's a little map. And we can see where all 
the tribes have been located. Okay? And so that's, that's Israel back here in Joshua. Now, on the news, there's all sorts of things about Gaza, right? Okay? That little teeny strip right there. In the middle of Israel. So that's the Gaza Strip. But it's, it's interesting when you look at the, at the land here, is Israel the same size as it was after Joshua conquered? No, it's smaller. When Israel first became a nation, it was smaller. But then their neighbors attacked them, and the Lord gave them victory, and they were able to extend the border. And then later on, their enemies attacked them again, and they put their border out a little little bit farther, but they're still not at the original land promised by God. So, as the Israelites took over the promised land, there were still remnants of the pagan cultures that were not wiped out, as God had commanded them to do. He wanted them all wiped out. What do you think the consequence of this would be for the Israelites in the future? They would idols. Idol worship would slowly come into the culture. Yep. Yep. Yes, it's in there. It's it's in there. I I'd have to look it up for you, but they they give his age when he dies. Usually most of the important people they'll tell you how long they lived uh, before they died and they'll also tell you how old they were when they had like their children. So, and, and we saw that when we were studying uh, Noah. We saw the ages of children, his age when he was having children. So, have you ever had doubts or questions about how God controls things, like the casting of a lot? How can we seek to understand these claims that are so clearly presented in Scripture? Well, I think I typed that wrong. No, God control. Do, 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 do. No, I don't want that question. That wasn't supposed to be there. All right, Joshua and Caleb are faithful examples of trusting in God and obeying him. How does this encourage you? How are you encouraged by Caleb and Joshua? No one here is encouraged at all by them. We've spent the last five weeks in Joshua for nothing. Nothing is impossible with God. I like that. Yes, yeah. So nothing's impossible because, like today, what we saw is their number, the opposing army, was as the sand of the sea, and they had horses and they had chariots. Okay, they, it was it was unbelievable odds against Israel. So so we learned that that's encouraging, because as we're going through tough times in life, if God's on our side. We can have faith in that, you know, because God's stronger than anyone else. What else? What other things about Joshua and Caleb, uh, about them trusting in God and obeying him, encourage you? God is always faithful. Yep. Yeah. Even when you're going through trials and tribulations, God is faithful. And we And, and sometimes it's... When we're going through tough times, it's, it's hard to remember that. I think uh, I, I know when I was younger, as if we went through a rough patch, I wasn't thinking about the Lord, and I think the rough patch was harder to go through. When you're going through a trial or tribulation, if you forget about the Lord and it's all about you, it's very miserable. If you go through a trial and tribulation, and as you said, the Lord is faithful, and you realize the Lord will use trials and tribulations to mold you and make you and refine you. And then as you're going through that tribulation, even though it hurts, it can give you a whole different state of mind. Yeah, so, yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, yep, that's good. Uh, how does the detail in the description of the division of the land relate to reality in the Bible? So, so we didn't go through that scripture, but basically it spells right out this tribe is going to have this land, and these are its borders. It gives specific details. 
So what, what do the details point to? Does it make it sound more like, like a storyboard or more like historical fact? Historical fact, yeah, it's given the details. You know, it, it, this isn't just some little story that was made up. Uh, our memory verse for this section, Joshua 1.9, 1, is a direct commandment to Joshua from God to be strong and courageous, knowing that God would not leave him. How do we apply this verse to our own Christian, our own lives as Christians living thousands of years later? How can we kind of take that verse? Be strong, courageous, knowing that the Lord will not leave you. We do the same. Right. You know, there's no doubt that this, Joshua's the recipient of this promise. Right? We'd all agree on that, you know. Uh, but we can take courage in the fact that when you obey God's commands, that he's faithful. You know, so we, we can take encouragement in that is to obey the Lord. Uh, Three, Hebrews 13, 15, and 16 says that God will never leave us nor forsake us. Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always. Yeah. And as far as being strong, Ephesians 6, 10 reminds us that when we are at work, we work with the power of God. Okay. When we think about, you know, we, we talk about works, you know, we, we don't want works that are hay and stubble, right? Those aren't good works. Those are just works. We want good works. The stuff that when they're refined in the fire, they're still there, like gold and silver and precious stone. But then Ephesians tells us that when we do those good works, it's not our work anyway. <laughs> and so it's God's work working through us. So we get our strength to do those things for God from him, not from us. We, we are his hands and feet. That's right. Yeah. Yes. And it's oftentimes his voice. That's right. Yeah, Ian. Joshua lived to be 110. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or thoughts on what we covered today? I know we went through a lot. Uh, I'm encouraged with, with Caleb because you and I would say at the point they came in, to go after the giants, is he a young man or old man? He's old, he's old 85. 85, you're right. So he's, a, he's an old man, okay? Uh, do you think he felt like it was time for him to retire from his ministry with the Lord? No. What? No. Okay, who here has found the retirement verse in the Bible? Because I haven't found it yet. I want to know if anyone found it. Yeah. We're in the, yeah, the Bible doesn't say it, okay? And... And so I, I think that's a, that should take encouragement for any of our senior saints that Caleb was an old man, but the Lord still had plenty for him to do. And the Lord still has plenty for all of us to do. I don't care how old you are, you're in the body of Christ, and he is giving you talents to be used for the edification of the body. And so if you're in a church, there's something for you to do, Okay. No matter how old you are. And I, I think I, I listened to Alistair Bag once, and, uh, and he had this complaint about snowbirds. That awful. They're not here, so I can talk about them. And, and you know what he said? He said they would never be in Florida if the church hadn't put them on the back burner. He said they would be here because they'd have responsibilities, and there's no way, reason they'd leave. They, they would know that they were important. They were, they were an important part of the church, and it's everyday running. And so I thought that was very interesting, is because somehow we take this idea of people retire at 65, that all of a sudden, if they're done with work, they're done with church. And, and, that's, and that's a bad attitude. And Caleb, to me, is a, a good encouragement of he's 85, and he's going to go in there and fight for the Lord. Isn't that amazing, though? That's another way that we differ. We are.
He was. He was. He was serving the Lord. Yep. So it doesn't. It doesn't matter, age-wise. We're here to serve. Yes. Yeah, she was, she was mentioned that, that it was Caleb and Joshua that went into the land. And then when Moses needed someone to, to come and serve with him, he, he chose Joshua. And, and it shows nowhere. She said that nowhere in the scripture does it say Caleb was upset about it. And, uh, and I just, and there's no doubt Caleb and Joshua, you know, the scripture doesn't tell us, but I bet you they were best buds. They were best friends. You know it. You, you, you know, and, uh, and so, yeah, that is an encouragement that sometimes we have different roles. Look at Billy Graham. Who was his, his number two in his ministry? No, not his son. Before that, who was the great singer? Bev oh, Beverly Shea. Okay. So who do people say was the better preacher out of the two of them when they were first starting out? Shea. Shea. Okay. Shea could have had his own ministry. He had it all. He could preach. He could sing. He could do it all. And he chose, the Lord had laid it on his heart that he was going to be in support of Billy's ministry. Okay? So he didn't, re, he didn't resent that. That was his role. And, and what a role he played in, with Billy Graham. What a role. And, and so sometimes I think, especially we talked about serving in the church. Sometimes people can resent the role that they play. Well, guess what? We have to have all these roles for things to work well. We all can't be preachers. We all can't be singers. We, we need the person that's willing to go push a shovel because it snowed and the ramp needs to be shoveled off. We need that person. You know, so, so and we can't look. Any job the Lord gives you is the best job you could possibly have. Because the Lord has it for you. And David gives us the greatest example is in the Psalms. David says, I just want to be the doorkeeper in heaven. Just let me open the door for people. That's here. This is a king of a nation. And he says, I just want to be able to open the door. That, because he realizes that no matter what he does in the service of the Lord, it's the best job ever. Boy, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if Christians served that way? I think people would smile more. I mean, man, Christians are sober these days. We should be the happiest people ever. Yeah. All right. So you got saved by the bell. The first bell rang. So why don't I close in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much uh, as we, we see here that Israel has obtained the land. We thank you for the example of Joshua and Caleb, Lord, and, and how even in, in an, at an old age, you are using them, Lord. And we can take comfort in that. We can take encouragement in that, Lord. For all of us here today, Lord, no matter what our ages are, I just pray that, that you'll help us find our role in your body. Help us find the place where we need to be to make this church run smoothly. And no matter what it is, Lord, we are serving you and let us find joy in that. And we just pray for the service to come, Lord. We Pray for pastor as he's up here teaching, Lord. Just give him the words to say, Lord. And not only give him the words to say, but with all those people in the pews, Lord, we just pray that you'll soften their hearts and open their ears so that your word will change lives. In your name, amen.